so you're here in um, the, the session titled Playing the Games of Thrones, ensuring the CISO role at the King's Table. And we've got Mr. Tom Langford, director from Sapien. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for uh, making it through to the, the last session of the day, apart from that other one by Seth Co. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about playing the game of thrones and how the CISO's role is actually not where it needs to be in, a, in an organisation. These are my observations based on my experiences, and I aim to bring, bring together some tools that you can use that will actually help you be more effective in your organisation. Some housekeeping of my own, everything I'm talking about today is only my opinion, it's got nothing to do with my employers, uh, so if you love it, it really is all my work. <laughs> <laughs> so why are we here? What I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a short two minute movie. Um, I'm saddened that it's not Game of Thrones info security, because you know, after a few hours on Google you realise that that doesn't really exist. But what it is, is a sh small movie that summarises the real problems that I think we face um, as CISOs or security people within the organisation and the challenges we have. And I think, you know, why are we here? It's because we don't own a pair of these, a pair of rose-tinted glasses. Well, you know what? We're just going to have to cancel Christmas then. Have you seen what's happening in the market today? No. Well, maybe you should subscribe to a financial blog so you'd know what's going on in the world. Yeah. Yeah, no. We're done. Jeff, thanks for stopping in. Listen, I need to talk to you about this year and budget proposal you put in. You've got some big plans. Uh, yeah, it's just that we're really at risk if I can't get the integrated intrusion management suite and, and we'll need 5,000 licenses. And then there's also the triple factor identity management system and I'm afraid it all adds up. But this, this is just the cost of keeping your data secure. Um, what do you think? <laughs> Jeff, I've always admired you and your work. Of course you can have the money. What is it, seven million? <laughs> no problem, but listen, do you have the ROI proposal? I mean, have you done the math behind this? No, but I just thought seven mil kind of sounded right. Uh, maybe a problem now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do we know if that's gonna be enough? I say let's put in 10 just to be on the safe side. <laughs> that would be amazing. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've been working out? No. Huh. This is happening. Just breathe. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> <A> girlfriend. <laughs> Okay, so I think the point made there was, you know, it's just, it's the, it's the cost of keeping our data secure. It all seems very vague. And it's, you know, the reason for that, I think, is that the CISO is not always pitched in the right place. Now, in Game of Thrones, they say that in the Game of Thrones, you either win or you die. Those are the two extremes. It's probably not quite as extreme as that when it comes to the CISO role. But what you do is that you're slowly choking your your organization's ability to work because you are not providing the value that's required for your business. You're not providing the information to the right people and as a result your business is not going to be as successful as it, as it could be. When I looked at this again and I found this even last night when I was in the bar talking to somebody uh, just about this and they told me oh we don't have a CISO in, in my organization. Really? It seems like perfect kind of organisation that has a CISO. After a lot of conversations, a lot of chatting, a little, while, a little later the gentleman said, ah, no we do have a CISO, it's just not called that. And so you end up with this concept where every single different term that we have here is thrown about and used inter in interchangeably. So we don't even have a common lexicon when it comes to the role itself. Now I don't know of any other C-level role that has ambiguity about what it does. And I think when it comes to the CISO role, I think that's exactly the problem we have. Head of security, risk and compliance. You know, what, it, it, 
Is that the same as a Chief Information Security Officer or is it different? There's nothing common out there that allows us to actually really define this problem. So on that, I thought I'd look at a different role. I'd look at the CFO's role. So the CFO in the 1960s didn't exist. According to a study by Princeton University, they studied a large number of organizations and tracked the number of CFOs that were in the business. So in the 1960s, we didn't have CFOs, we had accountants, and they counted money, and they paid people, and they got things done. But then we had this inexorable rise of the number of CFOs in the, in the companies. The reason for that was the business landscape was changing. And the way businesses need to, needed to use money was changing. They had to embrace this a lot more. They had to make the money work harder for them, if, if you'll excuse the, the, the phrase. And as a result, by 2000, uh, over 80% of companies within this study had a CFO position. So in the space of 50 years, we've, we've created a brand new role, effectively, within an organization. Now, <clears throat> I love the, uh, all of the reports that you get. This one's from PwC's State of Information Security. I also know that there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, and you can make these things work for you in any way that you want to. But this particular one, it's basically saying, what are the blockers that you experience in improving your information security program? And the top three there, or the first three there, all state leadership of a CEO, president, CIO, CISO, Anything, sea level or above, we've got you know 22 percent on one, 16 on another, 17 on another. That's huge. They're, we're saying that our leadership organise, our leadership groups of our of our organisations are actually blocking our ability to get our information security programs to work effectively. The two underneath that are very much related. Lack of an information security strategy. Well, how can you have a strategy if it's being built halfway down the organisation? That's not a a strategy. Strategies have to come from the top down. Lack of an actionable vision. Well that again, that has to come from the top down. You cannot just have uh, someone halfway in the halfway at the organization defining how that organization is going to proceed on a security basis. It's got to come down from the top. So <clears throat> I had a number of conversations with people and basically it, it, it's arguable how long this process started. 20 years, maybe 25 years ago, I don't know. But in the first place, I think the general consensus was security, information security started with the IT guy, had to install these newfangled firewalls and different types of routers, etc. And that's kind of, that's our history, that's our past. I've, and I've heard that stated a number of times. We've come from, you know, very much a technical background. It then progressed stuff started to happen, hacks started to happen, and we became the responders. We just dealt with problems, and I think this was where, when we come into uh, information security burnout, for instance, this is, I think, the nascent, nascent stages of when this happened. Because these guys were unprepared, untrained, all they knew was that they had to run around in circles until the job was fixed, you know, and they weren't allowed to go home uh, and, until such time. We're now very much squarely in this place. We're enterprise protectors. Well, I mean, we're called CISOs, right? So, of course, we're part of the enterprise. Um, <clears throat> so we are actually being seen as being a part of the business. But in my opinion, we're just in the wrong part of the business. Where we need to be, and some organizations have this, we need to be the organizational influencers of our organizations. We actually need to be changing the course of the ship or helping to change the course of the ship not having our message filtered as it reaches the, the, the leadership of the organisation that you're a part of. So you have to ask yourself, you know, am I in a position to change the course of the ship? Really, if you have budgets, authority, and you're, the ability to make decisions, I think yes. Many, many people in, this, in, the, in the security industry, in the CISOs that I have spoken to, as well as other companies as well, they don't always get that. They just get whatever the IT budget has left over, for instance. You know, they get the authority over a smaller group of the function, over the smaller functions of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the companies. So there's no teeth very often in these roles. So <clears throat> let's see what the view from the halfway up, halfway up is. 
this is a, deliberately a very uh, uh, traditional or, org chart. I mean, you're, everybody in this room is going to have a slightly different one. But really, this is fairly common. The CISO will report to the CIO, who reports to one of the CFOs, the COO, the general counsel, for instance. Um, the chief marketing officer, you know, they seem to have stolen a march of us, right? They've only just been invented, and look, they're already there. Um, and the problem we have here is that everything gets filtered, and everything has to be done so explicitly in order to make it happen that it's purely ignored. The reason I say that is, <clears throat> I, in my role, I get to look at a lot of security schedules from our clients, we're, we're a consultancy, we look at their security schedules, and we have to comply with their information security programs in order to ensure that we meet their standards. And very often, you, know, you find out in which part of the organization they sit, their security organization sits. So I've had to wade through 150 pages of security policy from somebody who sat at this level of the organization. Why is it 150 pages? Because it has to be so prescriptive that they can always just come back to it. Has the board or the CEO seen this document and signed off on it? I very much doubt so. I doubt it's even made it past the CIO. Uh, or even, the, you know, certainly maybe the COO has seen it, if we're lucky. And so therefore, it's prescriptive, it's very detailed, and it's subsequently ignored. Now if we push up the CISO position into this level, and I've seen this as well a number of times, we end up with a 20-page policy. Why? because the guys at the top have signed off on it and said, go and make it happen. Anything that comes out of that 20 pages, your procedures, your guidelines, are totally reinforced by those 20 pages that are properly written, properly reviewed, and properly, properly authorized. So, no RSA conference would be complete without one of these. So I had to drop this in, but this is what's actually helped. I was talking to a number of our organised, a number of uh, recruitment agencies, and they were saying that the rise of hacktivism, they saw a massive uptick in a lot of their uh, uh, recruitment campaigns. They were starting to sell far higher net value worth individuals into organisations as the boards became more available, as more aware of this risk. Now, quite how true this is, I don't know, but it does seem to be that. It's coming out into the, into the public eye far more, and there is far more interest in it. The problem is we're either being parachuted into the wrong places, um, or we're not being doing as effective a role as we can in order to address it. So, that's the introduction. That's setting the scene as to you know, why we're even talking this. So how do we gain the King's Trust? How do we get to the, to the, uh, uh, to the top table, as it, as it were? Well. I came up with a, I like things like the CIA triangle, for instance. It's very simple, it's easy, I can explain it to my neighbours. You know, what do you do for a living? Oh, well, information security, what the hell does that mean? Well, it's all about this. It's a very simple way of putting concepts across. I like simple concepts because I can understand them and I can repeat them very easily. So the CIA triangle doesn't really need much of an introduction. It's about the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability of, of your information, wherever that is. My view on this is we reinterpret it into three different tools that we can use. So it's purely a monomic, it just happens to have CIA in there. We move it around a little bit, and we come up with making sure that we can trust the integrity of the data that you're gathering in the first place. You need to know that what you are doing in your day jobs is actually providing good, um, good business data that you can rely on. You need to make it available to your business and your organisation in a way that makes sense to them, not that makes sense to you. And you need to gain the confidence of the business in order to be, you know, become a part of the Illuminati. So, let's go back to some more lies and damn lies. Again, it's the same PwC uh, uh, security report. This is basically saying what comprises, what elements comprise your uh, um, information security policy. That very top one is business continuity at 50%. 50% of people's information security policies have make a mention of business continuity. And that's as good as it gets. Everything else in there 
doesn't go anywhere else near where it should be. The one that appeared to me, and we could look at this, we could look at any one of these really, the one that appeared to me was security risk assessments is down at 32%. Now, if, if only a third of companies out there, according to this report, are doing security risk assessments or are doing it in a way that's serious enough to be put into their information security programs, how, how can you operate as a, as a CISO? How can you actually start to work your way through the risks? Now, I'm not going to go into how you should carry out your risk assessments, should it be qualitative or quantitative or whatever, that's, that's something else entirely. But what, I need to, what I'm trying to get across here is that it seems like a lot of people do not use risk assessments or do not understand risk within their business. So in looking at that, my view, I, I have a view of risk which is very much, or risk assessments and audit, which is very much human social. I don't like the fact that we're often seen as the enemy. I don't like the fact that you, know, you hear tales and you see videos done on YouTube that basically talk about how to cheat your auditor. You know, this is, you get your audit box out with all of your nice documents and you make sure that certain people have left the office for the day and you make sure, you know, John in accounts is on holiday because he's such an idiot and doesn't even lock his laptop and all that sort of stuff. All these things about how to cheat the auditor or cheat the assessor. And yet, this is somebody who can provide so much value to your organisation, who can actually work with you. So the thing is, you've got poor risk assessments, potentially. What does that lead to? That's going to lead to poor findings, right? That makes sense. If you're not doing your risk assessments properly or if you're being suckered into, 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 into believing certain things, your findings are going to be wrong. So your business, your, your data that comprises, that feeds into your business information is incorrect. If you're talking about risks that either don't exist, are exaggerated, are underreported, whatever. That's going to result in poor business information and that's going to result in poor decision making at whatever level that that information reaches. And then it goes all the way back to the beginning because the business is going to start making decisions that will affect your ability to do your job based on the incorrect information that you've sent through. Now to me, <clears throat> a risk assessment should be one of six things. And like I said, you could choose any one of those things on that list, but this is, this is just one way that you can look at things. For me, a risk assessment should always be non-judgmental. There should always be a very strong relationship between the person on one side of the table and the, and the person on the other side of the table, even if they've only met for five minutes. Absolutely non-judgmental. The moment you start to preach to them, the moment you start to become a, a little bit sort of patriarchal towards them, they will close down. The other thing, it's got to be educational. If, if both parties don't get something out of it, then nothing's happened, nothing's going to change. All one side has got is a slap on the wrist and all the other side has got is an extremely frustrating process that's going to result in you know, worse and worse assessments moving forwards. You need to be open. You need the best risk assessments are the ones where the people on the other side of the table are actually telling you about risks but you need to work with them in a way that will allow them to do that. We always say to our folks that it's, this is a, f a free security consultancy. Oh, okay, that's quite good. And by the way, we can help you get more budget for things, but we can only do that if we know what the risks are. You know? So we're here to help you work your way through this. It needs to be non-confrontational. Again, this cheat cheat the auditor, cheat the assessor, or deliberately hide things, deliberately trying to do stuff. That's got to be broken down. That's got to be, that can only be done with trust and building of strong relationships. They need to be constructive. You've got to get something out of it. The people on both sides of those tables need to agree on core actions. When we do them, we always have a factual accuracy check about a week later after we've, after we've gone away, written the report and sent it off. If they disagree with some of the things that are on there, we don't stop until we get agreement. Because if they think a risk is too high and we think it's low, they're going to ignore it anyway. They're in their, their own business unit, they'll just say, he didn't know what he was talking about, don't worry about it boss, it's rubbish. You have to try and convince them, or they you, that it's different. Ironically, we've also had cases where people have said, oh no, that's a much bigger risk. Okay, that's fine, I can pop that up a bit, makes no odds to me. 
but by having that constructive conversation, making sure that both parties agree to what's been in the report, has, in my experience, you know, made meant that the risk assessment itself becomes far more far more constructive. <clears throat> and it goes without saying, it's got to be collaborative. You've got to work with them. You've got to also maintain that relationship afterwards. This is not just a one-time affair every year. You've got to be working with them. You know, we have fortnightly calls with the teams that we're working, that we do risk assessments with, to help them close the risks. We then follow up with them on, you know, on regular basis. We try and assign the same uh, assessors to the same projects. Our projects run for fairly short periods of time, but we're trying to assign the same people to build that relationship and build that trust. So this is just the first tool. What this purely is, is taking another look at your core processes. Now that could be taking a look at your incident management program in an entirely new light. It could be taking a look at the way you deal with breaches. In this case, it's taking a look at how you do risk assessments and risk management and making it far more, uh, far more constructive for all of you. So <clears throat> we're gonna come to availability. So like all good InfoSec um, presentations, there's always a pyramid in there. Um, so down here, whenever you're gathering your, your data from your risk assessments, that forms the basis of your reports. That then gets put through a report engine and becomes information. And then that information automatically seems to create some kind of commentary that the board are going to understand. How? It's just gone through some mechanical process that's meant that you, you formatted a, a big Excel sheet into a Word document, effectively, and you've got some stats and some really good graphs that show that you're green here and you've got zero percent there. It means nothing. There's no commentary. I've heard boards described to me as being as dumb as Labradors before, which I think is extremely unfair on a board. But when it comes to very, very specific topics, I, I guess they are. They're not. Like on a board because they're dumb, they're on a board because they're incredibly intelligent, they know what they, they, they need to do, they know how to make your business succeed, but they are not security people. They do not understand every single TLA that we use, every single term, every single, you know, um, every single measurement that we use, every single KPI. <clears throat> you need to help them understand it through commentary rather than through just reporting. So therefore, business intelligence does not equal quality and coverage. You know, basically, you're not panning for gold. You're not throwing all of your data into, into something and sifting it out and saying, oh yeah, that looks interesting, we'll, we'll put that in a pie chart. Or, that one's good, we'll put that in a bar chart. This is not what it's about. You need to start with an idea. You need to start with a hypothesis, you could say. You've got to start somewhere where you're able to actually, how can you, sorry, where you're able to provide a valuable contribution to the conversation that's being had at that board level. So you start with the hypothesis. What is, what is my business belief here? It's that there has been, for instance, an increase in security costs over the last two years. It could be anything. There's been an increase in, a, you know, in, in attacks on our perimeter. There's been an increase in the costs of our hardware. There's been wh whatever it is. Um, <coughs> Then you establish a hypothesis as to why that might be. Uh, we think it's tied to the fact that we moved to bring your own device and we're working from home a lot. You know, and that's increased our costs, our security costs. Our IT costs might come down, but our security costs have gone up. Is this a good thing? What you've then got to do is to actually gather the data that's going to support this. And that data is going to go way beyond the stuff that you might normally find. This is not just IT data or security data. This is data from HR, this is data from legal, this is data from your training groups, you know, data from your financial groups. You've got to start gathering all of this data together and then try and work out what's going to be useful. You have to go way beyond your comfort zone in this because there are correlations in here that are important. There are correlations in here that you do not know that we do not know, that, they, that, that the, the people who are gathering their reports don't know, but there's correlations in there. It's at this point, with those correlations, you try and understand what those relationships are, because the relationships are not always what they seem to be on the surface. So, <clears throat> perhaps, 
again, you make, you know, I'm making this up here, but it's different for each organisation. Perhaps, you know, the, the working from home, the number of people we have working from home and who have a bring, you know, a, a bought their own device, plus have, you know, a certain remote access package or a preference for a certain remote access package, plus the fact that they started before 2010 when we introduced this particular security training, which we grandfathered them into. Um, you know, plus the the uh, decrease in um, you know office services costs, which means we don't have as many desks in the in the office, is going to result in increased costs. You work this out. This is the hard part. This is like the difference between qualitative and quantitative risk assessments. One's easy, one's hard. One gets better results. <coughs> one gets results. Okay. So you try and work out these correlations. Once you've got that correlation. Consider it as a brick. Put it down there and start to build on it. Because you've got a correlation, now you can start making another correlation. You can start making another correlation. You can start with another hypothesis and make another correlation from that hypothesis that builds off this. Well, we have seen an increase in security costs because of working from home and bringing your own device. But where has there been another uh, another increase in costs? Is that is are these two correlations related? Like I say, this is the hard part. You've then got to try and work out how you're going to use this stuff. And again, it's very much down to your house style, your functional requirements. You know, in what instances can I use this? Uh, you know, what can I do with the data itself? And your non-functional requirements, where is this data? How am I going to get hold of it? I mean, it could be spread to the four corners of your company. and Actually, you're now relying on that. You know, that data is important to you. If you can't get to it easily, if you don't know every month the training records that come in and you only get that yearly that's probably something you need to address you also need to understand <clears throat> how you're going to measure the fact that your correlation is, is either going up or down and is that a good thing you know one that one that we use for instance is that the co our cost of legal time on particular contracts because the more contracts that have our security schedules in there are quicker and easier for us to execute versus the ones that have client security schedules in there, which we have to basically manage by exception. We have to put up extra walls and extra security and different training and things like that. And the fact that we've invested into our legal departments to push this, and the fact that we've invested in our own security schedules and our own security standards to bring them up, to, you know, bring the bar higher, has actually resulted in a drop in costs on um, both you know, co uh, financial and time when it comes to processing contracts. That's the kind of KPI that you're looking at. Once you've got all this, now you can do a report. Now you can start to build it. You can use the off-the-shelf package. We happen to use SharePoint because you know, we, we have a SharePoint team that build this for us. <clears throat> but you also need to understand how to format it for your audience. And by that I mean, don't just think it's got to go out in SharePoint and a couple of graphs, or it's on an Excel sheet. Look beyond that. If all of your board have got iPads, how about using iBooks Author? You know, get some creative talent in to be able to knock a quarterly security report out that they can take delivery of on their iPads the morning or the week before the quarterly board meeting, and they can actually flick through and read in a far more cohesive and sensible manner than trying to interpret some bizarre Excel spreadsheet that's got ups and downs and a rag status that makes no sense. Actually, look at how else you can deliver it. Is it maybe a PDF, it may be PowerPoint, it's perfectly all right, but make sure you're doing it in a way that is consistent with your house style and your accepted approach, but also has the impact. So, the old way was basically gather your data and put it into a report. And you know what? I know I've said that there's a better way. There's nothing wrong with this as such. You're probably still ahead of most people and most organisations because at least you are gathering data and at least you are reporting on data, right? But really, this is where you need to be. You need to be understanding the hypothesis that you're trying to prove in the first place. Gather the data, understand the relationships with the data, understand how you're going to use it and where you're going to get it from, and then put it into a report. This longer, slower approach, once you've got it down pat, is actually something that's going to provide far more business intelligence to your organisation. 
and therefore allow you the chance to be showing yourself to be you know, far more uh, uh, useful and effective to the organization. And so, you know, just to put it graphically, you know, if your security reports look like this, you're stuffed, really. Nobody's going to read those. Um, and of course, because your security reports are delivered on iPads, you're going to win. That's obviously the, the case. Now, I say I'm obviously being you know, tongue in cheek here, but you are going to win if your board are using iPads and they like the graphical style because that's what the house you, you know, your, your, your house uses, right? If it's not iPad, it could be something else. It could be pieces of paper. That's fine, but make sure it's what they want, not what you want to deliver to them. So then we come on to getting the confidence. Now we do not, it seems, have confidence in the ability of our senior senior folks to listen to us. 38% this is just Hanover Research and a, a Ponemon Institute research. Again, utter lies, obviously, but very useful to make my point. Only 38% of non-executive respondents use business orientated language when communicating with senior executives. Well, that's a bit silly, isn't it? Because those senior level executives are business people. They're not security people. They're not IT people. That's, that's really odd. Why, why is 62% um, you know, of, 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 of people talking in this way? Half of the respondents rated their communication of relevant, to sec relevant security risks to executives as not effective. That means that that message is not getting up there. It's either being filtered because it's going through too many layers or you're not communicating in the right way. Because I would suggest, not because the board are as dumb as Labradors, but because actually we're not putting that message across in a way that's understood by them. And I think we can cure this with beer. <laughs> so <clears throat> I found a lovely quote that I like to use a lot. And it came from Steve Moura, who was the head of digital marketing at Miller Coors. Uh, and a colleague of mine you know, uh, quoted this yesterday in a, in a talk. And um, it, it, it's a fairly straightforward one, but what it does, in its simplicity, it really brings home how you should be dealing with your business. And whenever you are in, you know, in, in a situation to decide what to do, this is how you play it. Now, his statement was, this is what I need digital to do to help me sell more beer. Now, replace digital with security. That's what you need to say to yourself. How is what I am doing helping me sell more beer? Because if I'm not helping the business sell more beer, or time, or product, or whatever it is, then I'm not being effective. I'm actually not doing anything that's benefiting the business. So how do you start to do this? Well, again, in Game of Thrones, um, there's, there's this thing that everybody, uh, and I'm sure only about you know, a handful of people in here have even watched or read the books, but everybody seems to think that the House of Lannister's sort of saying is, a Lannister always pays his debts. And yet it's not, it's hear me roar. Okay, but that's, that makes the point, which is, you might think you know what your business is doing, you might think you know what it is that they need to do and how they need to do it, but actually you might not. I'm always amazed that when this question is asked, you know, how many people regularly read their company, um, their company reports? How many people regularly attend their company earnings calls, for instance, or understand you know, what, what goes on in, these, you know, <coughs> in the annual general meetings? Because if you don't, you don't understand your business. Because these are the sources of information that are available to you to start to understand what is making this business tick. Therefore, you are not doing security for security's sake, you're doing security for the sake of your business. And then back to the beer again. So this, I think it's a vital point. When you put the two together, you know, how am I helping sell more beer? And you know, how is my business doing? I think you get quite a powerful combination that will allow you to, to uh, you know, really deliver some impact to your senior leadership. So those are the three things that I've looked at, we're drawing to a close now. There's five guiding principles that we always try and work to when it comes to this. <clears throat> the first one is, you only provide the information that is absolutely necessary. You don't provide a vast spreadsheet full of, full of guff. You just provide the information that they require at the very top. Secondly, you need to simplify those experiences and interactions. 
you know, even the COO and all the people who are at that level that we all want, wish to be at, they don't get very much time with the board. They don't get as much time as they wish with the CEO. That when you do get that time with them, now that is not the time to pull out reams of paper and start pulling things, you know, showing them documents and, sh and showing spreadsheets and things like that. You need to be very clear about what messages it is that you wish to put across them and what you need from them. You need to build and maintain trust. That's a kind of an obvious one, but it's, it's worth stating because if that, that's always got to be there at the back of your mind. That means you need to be effective in communicating security risks upwards. And, they, and you need to make sure that there is an effective response when it comes down. That means that they, start, they will start to trust you to tell them the bad news as well as the good news. You know, or even the, the, the slightly half bad news that's, you know, that you're trying to shield them from if need be. You need to optimise your dependency activities, so you know, where your data is coming from, for instance. You will find yourself really working with a broader range of people. Uh, just this morning, uh, Josh Corman talked about, go talk to your general counsel. They're a fabulous source of information. They understand risk. Um, I know some organisations, my own included, the CISO actually reports to the general counsel. It's been awesome. We've got so much more done as a result of operating and reporting to a different side of the business. But it's not just them. You need to talk to the CFO. You need to talk to the COO. You need to talk to your, the guy in front of manu in, in charge of manufacturing your, your your beer or whatever. You need to broaden that out quite massively, much more than you probably feel comfortable doing. Actually, find out what challenges they have and work out what um, what you can do to either help them, but also what they can do to help you. Finally, you've got to be consistent. Whatever risk methodology you use, if you say something is you know, bad today and good tomorrow, that's really not going to go down too well. Those, that consistency in your reporting, that consistency in the facts that you're putting across, is absolutely vital. So, <clears throat> we've just come to the, the, the final three sides, four sides actually, of, of the key takeaways. Really, when it comes to the value, we're going back to that very first point with the risk assessments. Asking yourself is, is your organisation really getting the full value of your organisation, of your, of your activities? Are you doing risk assessments as a compliance activity or because it's an important business component of how the, the business is run? If it's purely a compliance activity, the organisation is getting some value but not full value. You need to change that attitude. Business intelligence. You need to look at how your security group is reporting to the business. Understand those interactions. Make sure you are talking to them in their language, not in your language. You know, follow these five steps if you like. That's one way of, of synthesizing uh, business information and business intelligence, sorry, and uh, commentary in a, in a, in a very uh, uh, methodical but effective manner. Finally, ask yourself how much do you really understand of your business? Really, do you honestly know, you know what, what your profit lines are, what your profitable lines are, sorry, your profitable lines of business are and which ones are less profitable? Do you understand you know, how you're financed? Do you understand what pressures are going on in the market? Do you understand your earnings, etc.? Really start to understand, work out what you need to do to sell more beer. So, just in closing, the one thing I would say is do be careful what you wish for because with responsibility is going to come accountability. And uh, if we get this right, there's going to be a whole boatload of work coming down our way you know, because we're engaging in a far different way. You know, you may not have time to keep up all these certifications and things like that, but that's fine because. We're not security people anymore, we're business security people. And that, I think, is the distinction. That's the end. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there's hordes of people who want to ask questions, and I've got one already at the back. Yes, Josh? Where's the bloodbath? <laughs> well, I'm, it was a bit small in here. I didn't want to bring in the broadsword. Any other questions? Yes, Josh. He's my plan. You said you report to legal counselors or general counsel. Yeah. What 
what advantages is that afforded you as a CISO that you wouldn't otherwise have gotten? I think we've got funding for things you know, a little bit more easily. Uh, I know we were talking about this earlier. We've got you know, DLP, for instance. You know, one of the key drivers for that was the recognition by the legal departments that the need to protect not only our intellectual property, but the intellectual property of our clients and, and the personal, uh, personally identifiable information, sensitive, confidential. Now, if we were going through an IT route, for instance, I think that would have been a far more challenging conversation to have. It would have been filtered out. It would be seen as a cost because the IT route is not seeing the implications of lawsuits, you know, going to court to get data recovered and things like that. Coming out through a general counsel's view, not only was he sitting a little bit, you know, one step close to the CEO, for instance, he could have that conversation. He could have a, a security conversation about the benefits of DLP, you know, as a result of us talking to him. So he was, the, the CEO was hearing it from basically, you know, his, the, the king's hand, if you will. You know, it's one of his trusted advisors. So that has helped us immensely. <coughs> I do still think that we would be better served being at that same level, um, and I, that, that, that org chart I gave was a very much uh, um, you know, standard viewpoint. Everybody's is different. You know, but this, we found a lot of benefit from it, from moving from under the CIO to the COO and now the, the, uh, the general counsel. So I think just listening to us and seeing the problems that we're raising and actually fully understanding the implications means we actually get more of what we feel we need. Yes? Uh, how do you look at uh, the budget thing? Because uh, in IT, normally uh, investments in IT are the responsibility of the IT manager, director, whatever. Yep. Uh, however, uh, security improvements most of the time have an IT component. Yep. So whose budget is it? And so that, that's a challenge we have. So how should we do this we've done it both ways, to be honest. We've done it where we've, where we've scheduled, sorry, where we've uh, budgeted the money for um, whatever it was. It was a, a particular type of encryption rollout. And we paid for it, but IT owned it and implemented it. But the other way, which is a bit more long term, we did it this way because um, our budgeting was a little bit easier in, in the early days. Um, what we now do is because we're planning, you know, a year advance, etc. We're actually saying this is what we want to implement, and it needs to hit the IT P&L. So IT will have their own budget, and then our budget will kind of be transferred across in order for them to help do that. Now, it's different for every single company. Um, you need to work on your relationship skills and your influencer skills as well, because to build that relationship with the, the CIO to tell him to do more work and spend more of his money is always going to be quite challenging. But if you're working in the right structure and the business is seeing the benefit, the CIO as a service operator needs to provide that service that the business is now expecting. You know, so I think that's, that's the important distinction. It's kind of going up the pyramid to come back down rather than across, but you need to make sure you're working closely with him. Anything else? No? Okay, well thank you very much indeed.